as is always the case, you and I have showed up with far too many specimens and slides to show them all to you. I'm going to stick to my notes to try and move pretty quickly through this. But the context for this project, it, I think for you guys, has to be an understanding that Arkansas attracted more African-American migrants after the Civil War than any other state in the United States. And up until 1920, that was the year that it flipped, up until 1920, between 1865 and 1920, more African Americans moved to this state than any other state. Uh, about 200,000 African Americans moved to Arkansas, and I think Pennsylvania is like 178,000 as the second runner up. So when I was trying to figure out why did so many African Americans move to Arkansas, the conventional wisdom is, and, and to some extent it is true, that it is about politics, that because African Americans could vote in Arkansas for a longer period than was true, say, in Mississippi, but that's why they voted. But African Americans started moving here before the 14th and 15th Amendments, and even before the Civil Rights Act. And it certainly wasn't about a, um, sort of a better, more tolerant racial climate. That's a question I often get. I have never once seen that in 378 explained narratives I moved mean, because it was a better racial climate. So um, and when I really started to look at my sources again, I people were talking about stuff that I didn't even understand. They were talking about chinqua pins, they were talking about speckled trout, they were talking about dewberries. And ha you know, having grown up with Theo, I would just think like I just gotta ask Theo what this stuff even is. We started collaborating and really realized that um, this, these natural resources are such an important part of African American post Civil War history because Arkansas's black history is really African American history because so many people then move on from Arkansas and end up in Chicago, Gary, Indiana, Illinois. So, this is an important story in American history, not just in Arkansas history. Um, one other thing to uh, know is that Arkansas, unlike more established southern states back east, remained wilderness until uh, well after the Civil War. So if you look in 1870, 19 out of every 20 acres in Arkansas was undeveloped. And in the census, if I put a fence on something, that's developed. And you all seen the fences around here, so that's a low bar, right? Um, so just to give you a sense of comparison, I was asking Theo, like, how much arable land is there in Virginia? And in Virginia, about one in every four acres is developed. But when you take out is it the Appalachian Mountains and the yeah. Um, then you really are getting to one in two acres. Tennessee, another southern frontier state, would be one in four in 1870. So part of what I want to do to begin, before I talk to you about how um, free people in Arkansas use natural resources, is I just want you to talk to you a bit about what is Arkansas like in the mid-19th and the late 19th century. Because when we say words like forest and river, what that means to me in 2020, and what that means to a free person talking about a forest they saw in 1870, I've come to learn two completely different things. So the landscape that would have been encountered during the time period Story was just talking about is very, very different than what we know today uh, in Arkansas. At that time, there were very few roads, no highways, the rivers were the highways, and the rivers themselves would be very different than the rivers we know today, in that they were wild. Today's rivers are very much controlled and managed by the Corps of Engineers. There's dams and locks and dredging and dikes and scraping operations to navigate, uh, increase navigation on these rivers. But back in that time, these rivers ran wild, and that meant sometimes they were very docile and low. You could walk across the Arkansas River in a lot of places. Uh, there were rapids on these big rivers. Um, but then sometimes they were really, really out of control. Big floods. Uh, it's very different than what we see today. There's a, a great uh, illustration that Story turned up of a house boat there going down, uh, going down the river. And there's a lot, of, uh, a lot of accounts of this sort of a thing. This is a, a quote I'm going to read by Thomas Nuttall. It's from about 200 years ago. He came through. Arkansas in 18, 
at the very end of 1818 and 1819. And uh, this is a quote from northeastern Arkansas on the Mississippi River. A few miles below, we observed the river contracted within a narrow space by a spreading sandbar or island and planted almost across with large and dangerous trunks, some with the tops and others with the roots uppermost in a perpendicular posture. The water broke upon them with a noise which I had heard distinctly for two months. Like the, cas like the cascade of a mill race in consequence of the velocity of the current with all our, and with all our caution to avoid them, the boat grazed upon one which was almost entirely submerged and received a terrific jar. So this is just, these were wild and woolly places. So just a, a quick quote to kind of give that context. And the forests that would have been encountered at that time uh, hard for us today to really appreciate the extent uh, and the size of some of these forests. There are very few places today in Arkansas where you can see a, an example of a primary or so-called virgin uh, forest. Uh, and I've got some pictures of a few of those places to give you an idea. This is the, the White River National Wildlife Refuge in uh, south, uh, sort of, well, eastern Arkansas, um, what we call the Big Woods today. And you can see uh, these big bottomland forests uh, shown in black, these swamp forests that were flooded. Uh, this is the largest tract of intact, uncut Cypress Tupelo swamp forest uh, in the state. It's on the uh, Iowa de View and the Cache River in eastern Arkansas. These trees are a thousand years old. And uh, aha. Yeah, there's uh, Tom Fotai, former ecologist at the Natural Heritage Commission for Scale. He's a regular size guy, so uh, pretty impressive uh, forest down there. And not just the bottomland, Cypress Tupelo, but on higher terrace lands of these big rivers, some of the largest oak forests, uh, massive trees, and so on down there. In the upland areas, there were large forests as well in many parts of the state, but not all. Uh, this is on Southern Crowley's Ridge, a 350-acre remnant old-growth forest of beech magnolia oak uh, called the Turkey Ridge Research Area. But today, 92% of the bottomland forests, for example, just those types of forests in eastern Arkansas have been drained and cleared for agriculture. So uh, what we see today is very different. And to enter that landscape 200 or 150 years ago was to really walk off the face of the map and into wild prehistorical kind of a, a context. Uh, and of course the forest was a lure for people uh, of, of all backgrounds to come here uh, and work and uh, make use of that resource. Uh, there are pine forests and the acidic soils across the state. Uh, they didn't flood regularly and that was a major economic throw. Yeah. Um, I made us include that picture even though it's from Louisiana because I spent two days trying to find historical images of people of African descent with um, old growth trees and it is very hard to find and that is part of what this project is about I mean, you can see Theo and I are both white a lot of our images contain white people and although in some ways we perpetuate that, I think we're also interested in seeing how is it that black people are being written out of and depicted um, somewhere other than nature. And so even though this is across the line from Stamps, Arkansas, Louisiana, I was like, oh my gosh, this is going in the PowerPoint. And it also helps us make a point that even though we don't have the images, we have a lot of other evidence that we'll be talking about. And that this is something we need to address as we think about current policy related to our parks and preservation. Not all of the state was forest. Arkansas had probably at least 2 million acres of treeless natural grasslands uh, 160, 170 years ago. Uh, almost every bit of that is either gone or very highly altered today. But uh, this was a major draw for people who uh, managed grazing animals, or people who did certain types of agriculture, uh, and for settlers who could settle on the edge of these open grasslands and have that resource available without having to go through the labor of clearing the forest. And just as an example, the largest uh, grassland area in the state was the Grand Prairie of Eastern Arkansas, centered on Prairie, Lone Oak, and Arkansas counties. 
about a half a million acres of treeless grassland there in 1830. Uh, today there's about 400 acres left in tiny fragments, 99.99% uh, loss. Sorry, I the wrong thing. Uh, another area that Story is going to talk a little bit about. So when we were putting together the slides and I saw this, I was like, oh my gosh, that's Cherokee Prairie. This is the first area settled by African-American homesteaders after the Civil War in Arkansas. One of the major draws for African-Americans to Arkansas was the Southern Homestead Act and a community mostly of individuals from the Fort Smith area, but also of black Georgians settled on Cherokee Prairie. So when I saw the slide and things together, I was like, oh, I know where this is now. So Cherokee Prairie is in the western part of the Arkansas River Valley uh, near the town of Charleston, uh, east of Fort Smith. And uh, that area has really the largest um, <coughs> remaining tracts of remnant or never been plowed ancient grassland that we have. Uh, and it's ecologically one of the highest priorities for conservation in the state. And uh, the Natural Heritage Commission, the Nature Conservancy, uh, and others are working very aggressively to try to protect as much of the remaining remnant prairie out there. Okay. So, um, I just want to briefly mention that a pretty obvious fact that is the first African American migrants who came to Arkansas didn't do so voluntarily. You can see from the statistics on the slave population in Arkansas that while plantations arrived late in Arkansas compared to, say, Georgia or Alabama, once they took hold, the growth in the enslaved population was dramatic. So you can see, compare 1840, 1850, 1860, that's not natural increase. That's forced migration. And so the first African Americans arriving in Arkansas did not want to be here. Arkansas symbolized essentially being orphaned or widowed by the internal slave trade or being taken with a slave holding household away from your family. So the fact that Arkansas ended up being an attractive place for African Americans was somewhat of a surprise to me because the associations with being sold away or taken away to Arkansas were not good. And as you can imagine, when African Americans arrived in Arkansas, the labor on the frontier was also more intense. On top of doing all of the regular labors demanded of slaves, everything from raising cotton to raising white people's children, you have on top of it the mandate to clear this forest. You've seen these trees with essentially Stone Age technology. They didn't even have cross-cut saws at this point. They had axes. And that's something I can get more into, but when we see those flat fields of the Delta, some of them were, of course, cleared after the Civil War. But we have to understand the human labor that went into clearing those fields. And, you know, cotton was the United States' biggest export in the antebellum era. It was to the United States what oil is to Saudi Arabia. So to understand the wealth that came out of black labor in clearing these forests, um, it's pretty remarkable. I, one of the only things I'll say about the, we have a whole section of our research that's on um, the memories of enslaved people about nature, but one of the things that bridges both the arriving African Americans in the antebellum era, the era of slavery, and immediately after the Civil War is predators. Predators can incredibly high profile and narratives, much more so than trees or floods. And um, one of the things that, that I realized in working with Theo is that I had collapsed rural, the rural environments from which many African Americans came, areas of pasture land and plantation dotted with forests for Arkansas, where it was more like a pasture or a, or a plantation that was like an island surrounded by this vast sea of ancient forest. So for many individuals who were forced to migrate to Arkansas, and for many who came after the Civil War, these black folks had heard about bears, they'd heard about mountain lions, they'd heard about all of these apex predators, but they were already extinct in the East, and so for many of them it was the first time that they observed some of these animals. So let me talk about them. So some of the, uh, the animals that are mentioned uh, in these historical narratives of course, include bears, which was the black bear. It's the only bear native to Arkansas uh, outside of ancient prehistory, um, which would have been very common. In fact, Arkansas 
was known as the bear state because it was a very valuable commodity, bear meat, bear grease, bear oil, bear skin, uh, and we lured a lot of people here. Uh, wolves were here. Uh, the red wolf, Canis rufus, was the, the wolf that was widespread in Arkansas. It is today uh, completely gone. That's on the verge of extinction. There's a handful left. Mountain lions were very often referred to and common at that time. Uh, they're still around today in very low numbers in Arkansas. Uh, the advent of modern game cameras has dispelled the myth that we don't have mountain lions. There's a lot of good evidence uh, now for that. These are also called pumas or uh, panthers. Panthers typically uh, the local uh, name for them. And you'll hear all these accounts of terrified people listening to what sounds like a woman screaming in the night. And that is the vocalization of, of the mountain lion. Panther. Uh, that, that came up uh, a couple of times. Let me tell a couple of stories sure. before we move on. So, um, just a couple of stories that I found really fascinating. Bears were a subject of great interest because they're so clever. They acted sometimes like people. And so, one gentleman was describing how he survived bears. He said, it was really important when I moved here, because he's from Richmond, Virginia. He moved to the area now, down near Texarkana now, which is a total wilderness. He was like, you know, I survived. I found a tree just barely strong enough to hold me with a thin trunk. I was a skinny young man, and I climbed it. And then if the bear tried to grab onto it, he was so big that he couldn't climb it and climb the tree after me. But bears were not always after you, but, you know, sometimes they were. So another thing that, that another gentleman noticed is he said, you know, bears, when I got here, I hadn't seen bears before, and the first time I saw a bear, he was stealing our corn. This was a man who migrated to Arkansas after freedom. He said, you know what that bear did? It gathered all the corn up in its arms, got to my fence, threw the corn over the fence, and climbed over the fence, and then picked up the corn on the other side and walked away. So that, and, and there were a lot of snake stories, a lot of mountain lion stories, um, of missionaries for the AME Church, African Methodist Episcopal Church. That was like a rite of passage to write about how, like, just so you know, that gentlemen, when you are a missionary in Arkansas, and you hear that sound like a woman is screaming, that's no woman, that's a panther, so just stay in your bed. Um, but all of these stories um, were so important that when at the WPA interviewers came around in the Great Depression during the New Deal to interview, I have three occasions where the interviewer will say, tell me a ghost story, and instead she gets a nature story because that's what people really want to talk about. And one gentleman even says, I don't have a ghost story, but I have the best snake story you've ever heard. And he said, we thought we were, we were in a building, an abandoned house, and by Bartholomew, and he, he was a young man who was, that was after freedom, he said, we heard this crashing sound, and we ran into the room, we thought we were going to see a big ghost, and he said, I saw something even crazier, a water moccasin bashing its own brains out against the wall. He said we screamed and ran away, and we never went back to that building again. <laughs> so, um, yeah, so another thing that was really important that uh, applies both to um, African American life under slavery and also after slavery are the cane breaks. I didn't know what a cane break was. I'll be real honest, I thought it was a swamp. It's not. Um, and I would say, Thea, why are cane breaks such a big deal? Why are enslaved people running away to these cane breaks, hiding out? They don't get caught. How can you hide out in a cane break and not get caught? And then you see, after the Civil War, um, with the start of Reconstruction and African American political rights, those African American families that didn't have guns to protect themselves when they voted, they would go and camp in the cane on election night and the night before. And so he was able to explain what canes do. So a cane break is the name for a very dense thicket of our only native bamboo. It's called river cane or giant cane, typically. Um, and it is, it looks like bamboo. It's not as maybe tall as some of the Asian ones that get planted. Uh, this is a <laughs> specimen of it. These are real plant specimens from the Natural Heritage Commissioner of Area. I'm going to pass these around and let you look at some of the Examples of some of these plants we're talking about. I ask that you hold them with both hands and don't bend them, please. They are in plastic sleeves. Just sort of hold them gently, but feel free to examine them. I'm going to pass this around. And the thing about these cane breaks is they're very dense. I mean, uh, 
In, in some really thick cane brakes, you might have dozens of stems in a square foot. So you almost can't walk through the cane brakes. You have to park the cane and sort of step through it. Um, it's tall, or it can be tall. Uh, there's historical accounts of 25 foot high cane thickets, and they're very expansive in some places. They, uh, are, I'll show some maps of some early cane that was mapped in Arkansas, hundreds of acres in a single dense cane break with no uh, break in it. Um, and they're evergreen. It's an evergreen thing. So even in the winter time, you've got pretty good uh, cover in there from being seen. And the further you go in, the denser it is. You can't see very far in there. Um, you can also clear out trails through the cane brake. You can clear out little rooms in the cane brake and have little protected uh, areas in there. Um, this is a cane brake in Miller County, Arkansas, southwest, uh, back in the 1970s, uh, with a little area cleared out inside it. You can just sort of see how dense and thick that is. Um, but yeah, difficult to get through. The other thing about cane brake uh, that I think is important here and you don't know unless you've been through one, is the noise it makes. A person or an animal traveling through a cane brake makes a terrific racket. So these canes are, it's like hollow bamboo, right? So they can be about an inch thick or so, typically. And they rattle together and make a big noise. And there's the rustling of all the leaves on the upper part of the stem. And so if you were hiding still in a cane brake, and someone else was coming in after you, or you're hunting and you're on the trail of an animal in your way, you would hear that uh, at a distance, and if you knew a system of trails or you knew the way through the cane brake, uh, you'd have plenty of warning of anybody coming. I think that had a lot to do the dense cover and then the, uh, the hearing anything moving through the cane brake had a big part to do with why these are so prominent in there. Um, when Theo explained this, how nature is serving as a warning system, it immediately brought to mind the story I read an interview with a former slave named Lizzie Johnson who expressed this common theme that I would see, she would say, planters are for afraid to go in the woods. And I'd always thought of bloodhounds as being something terrifying, and they are. But she said, they wouldn't go in there without their dogs. And I started to see that as a sign of the weakness that planters felt that they didn't know the environment as well as enslaved people and later free people, and so they wouldn't travel anywhere without dogs. And she said her father said he and other slaves would make bow and arrow when they were out in the woods. And put together with what Theo shared with me, you start to understand how African Americans are learning the environment and using that knowledge to protect themselves and leverage power. So the other thing to know about cane is we still have a lot of river cane around, but it's not like it was. We don't have giant cane breaks anymore, in fact. They uh, are a habitat of conservation concern that land managers doing conservation and game management are trying to increase the cane breaks. We do a lot of work trying to manage areas so that the cane can thrive and even replanting cane in places. Um, and it, the reasons for that are pretty complicated, but historically they were, there were some massive cane breaks. This is a, a map, uh, it's the original GLO or Government Land Office survey uh, plat map for a place in Arkansas. Uh, and it shows, that it's a mile by a mile grid there for scale. And those areas in red were mapped as continuous cane breaks, cane thickets like I've been talking about. Uh, so that one is uh, on the order of 800 acres, I think. And that's the area today, of course, it's all been cleared off uh, for agriculture. Um, and the other thing about cane breaks real quick is, and this has to do with a conversation Story and I had when she was first asking me about cane breaks. People have the assumption that they're swamps because they're in bottomland ecosystems, they're on big river terraces and so on. But the cane is actually not in the wet spots. It's on a little bit elevated dry ground. It's usually a little sandy. And that's its little niche, that's its habitat. So even when it's in the wet season and the rivers are flooding in the floodplain and so on, a lot of times the cane breaks are actually up elevated and dry. So that's another reason maybe there's a lot of people uh, hiding and camping in the cane breaks because they were dry. So um, I, I wanted to shift now to talking more exclusively about some of our evidence from after emancipation, when African Americans used this growing knowledge of wild resources to create opportunities for self-determination, to contribute to their own well-being and their communities flourishing in a society that was really set up 
for white control and African American subordination. Nature provided, I, I would guess, a plan B or an escape route for many individuals. And one of the things that we see a lot is the collecting of wild foods. This is not just about going back to nature, though for many individuals it was. A lot of the people coming here were from Richmond, Charleston, cities. So these were skills that they were acquiring on the ground. But it's also about avoiding debt, avoiding getting ensnared in financial systems that are meant to create bondage for people of color. And so these are some of the different foods that came up. Chikopin is one of the foods that got me into this project because it came up so much. One woman said that when she was um, moved to Texas and she saw Chikopin, she started to cry because it made her miss Arkansas so much. So can you tell us a little bit about Chikopin? So, um, chinko pins, or chinko pins, as it's often pronounced, uh, is, a, is our native chestnut. And we have two different ones in Arkansas. We have a uh, one, they both used to be trees. Uh, today, they are no longer trees. Or if you find a tree-sized one, it's very rare. There's a fungus that was introduced from Asia that does not hurt the Chinese chestnut, but is lethal to the uh, American ones, and it kills them to the ground. And then they re-sprout from the base and kind of form a small shrub. And it's rare even today to find one that's large enough to flower and fruit. Uh, but when it does fruit, this is kind of what it looks like here. So it has a spiny burr, like a chestnut, Chinese chestnut that you may know, or English chestnut. Uh, and inside is, um, whoops. Sorry, I guess that one picture is not coming up. There's a little hard nut. It looks like a little dwarf chestnut. And I actually have some here. Um, I'm gonna pass around a little dish. Now the spines will prick you, so don't, don't grab them too hard. But in there, uh, these are the spiny burrs are like the capsule that pops open and inside are these little nuts, the little shiny brown chestnut colored nuts. And uh, there's one sort of in, in the top here. I'll pass that around you can look at. It. And then here is a specimen of the actual um, a fruiting tree, which is again not common to find uh, from North Arkansas, that's that as well. But these are uh, very high protein, very tasty. You can roast them uh, just like a chestnut. They are a chestnut, and um, they used to be very, very common in acidic soils throughout Arkansas. There's accounts of people gathering them up with shovels and filling wagons, <coughs> and kids selling them. All that story. I'll tell a little more about that. Um, I, I want to jump into berries. Um, dewberries and blackberries, we see in the accounts all the time. Both because they grow as the Ostami in disturbed areas, so you can have a little snack while you're working. Also, they were a way to get money. Especially in the Freedmen's Bureau records, we see children, African American children, selling these wild berries and using that money for school fees. Also, uh, collecting and selling crawdads for school fees. Um, which going to school in 1866, 1867 was a direct threat to white supremacy. So being able to use nature to earn that money was really important. Yeah. Here are dewberries and blackberries. They are both have a fruit like a blackberry that you would consider, you know, look like a blackberry. Dewberries are little vines that trail along the ground. And then the high bush blackberries are the, the tall ones that you, you've no doubt seen. Uh, of course, they're excellent to eat. I mean, possum grapes, right? We have several, yeah. Okay. Let me let you talk about grapes. So grapes, again, another one. We have uh, about seven different native grapes in Arkansas. Uh, all of them are, are pretty tasty, but I think the best are, of course, the muscadine, which you've probably heard of, and uh, possum grape, uh, which is a large, sweet blue fruit. Uh, there's three different great specimens here. I've got the gray bat grape, the possum grape, and then of course the muscadine, which has uh, not a big cluster, but individual little round grapes as well. Uh, and one or more species is found pretty much all over the state, so it's not hard to find a, uh, a wild grape. Uh, they were abundant. How many of you know what a pawpaw is? That makes my heart happy. I didn't know what a pawpaw was. But That's I, an all-time record. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but pawpaws were also came up in the sources a lot. And one of the fun things is seeing sometimes somebody in the in the narrative would tell the interviewer, hey, you know, 
I would go to this place, I knew this pop pop group in Dardanelle, and I would sell them two for a nickel. And then you look in the census, and that person owned land by 1870. How did that person own land by 1870? They knew where the pop pop group was, and many other natural resources that they were using to earn money and purchase land. What does it taste like for this food? The pot pot tastes, I think, kind of like an overripe banana. Uh, some people don't like it. I'm not much for it myself. But, <laughs> but some people really think it's great. And uh, so if you've never had one, you can beat the uh, raccoons and possums to them. Uh, they're, they're really, it's worth trying for sure. Um, the fruit is the largest sort of edible uh, native North American fruit. And they'll get about the size of a fist, uh, sometimes even longer. Uh, they look, it's also called a custard apple, but it looks like, uh, you see there, it's just a cool cylindrical fist-sized thing. The flowers, I, I, you know, it's hard to have a, a specimen of a, a fruit, so there's one that's smashed here. And you can see the seeds inside, the large seeds, like bigger than a lima bean, kind of the same shape. Uh, it, but they flower before the leaves come out in the spring, or right as they come out. And the flowers are quite pretty. They're uh, this sort of reddish color here. And they smell, they smell like rotting flesh. And, uh, and that's actually an important thing. It's a, it's a mechanism to draw their pollinators. They're pollinated by flies and, and carrion beetles and things that eat rotting meat. And it's the color and the scent of rotting meat. So they look nice and they don't smell very good. But um, there's even some neat, it, it's become an in, uh, economic fruit. There's people that grow them for food, sell them. And uh, they have orchards of pawpaws, and one of the techniques that the, uh, the people who grow them do is pick up roadkill and hang it in the pawpaw grove uh, from the trees to help bring in more pollinators. So, an interesting little story. Yeah. I, I think that the gentleman who owned land from selling pawpaws shared Theo's uh, feeling about pawpaw because the interviewer's asking him questions, he's talking about pawpaws, and at the end, I'm prompt to say, a pawpaw. That's one fruit a hog will not eat. <laughs> um, I mean, wild onions come up frequently, wild garlic, um, wild honey, that often comes up because it's such a joyous memory for people coming across honey. One gentleman remembered that he was crossing the Red River on a, a what was called the Red River Raft, this big matted, gnarled, uh, like overlay on the Red River that went on for miles and miles of like trees and mud. It was over 100 years old. He said, there we were crossing and we all stopped because we found honey and we all feasted on honey for a while. But you had to be careful of the bears when you went after the honey. Sure. And it's interesting because honeybees uh, are not native to North America, but they got here very early, uh, probably in the late 15 or in the 1500s. And they were naturalized in Arkansas widely by when Thomas Nuttall came in 1819, even before. So they were widespread and a natural part of, or a, a naturalized part of our ecosystems very early. The wild uh, onion, if you go back one slide. Um, there's about several different species, and some of them are found sort of in intact grasslands and kind of rare habitats today, but others are really plants of weedy, disturbed ground. Uh, and, and they would have been very widespread and easy to get. You could just go off in your dooryard or down the path and, and find some kind of wild onion you could dig up. And they taste just like onions that you would cook with today. Uh, there's some that are more garlicky, uh, they have different common names and so on, but widespread and common and uh, widely used. Um, we're going to transition probably oh, to Mexican. It's a mess, yeah. Yeah, it also can taste good, but we're going to transition into a few medicinal plants and then we want to stop for questions. We have um, some other slides that we can show you if you have questions about them. <clears throat> but um, the medicine was really fascinating to me, and it's been an area that's grown um, the more we dig into it. I do want to mention that medicine is considered one of the most culturally hybrid features of Southern culture. It is almost impossible to distinguish what is African, what is Native, and what is European. So we're not claiming that this is exclusively African American. In fact, many African Americans will say, I learned this from my Cherokee dad. But because African Americans have always been a multiracial people, a lot of Native American medicine in particular comes up in interviews. So, um, Sumac. So, one of the main uh, 
things that all sorts of historical accounts, not just the African American ones, talk about is making a, a drink from sumac fruit. And uh, we have two, well, we have two really common sumacs. We have five in the state, but two that are really widespread and common to find. And they both have these clusters of red, hairy fruit. And if you ever find it in fruit, take one and put it in your mouth, and it tastes like lemon. It's very strong, astringent, lemony taste. And you can take those fruit and soak them in cold water and make a lemonade type of drink. And uh, I don't know how good that is for you in large quantities. I'm not recommending it uh, as a health practice, but but it is. Uh, you certainly get the flavor of it and, and see why people would use it. And it was used medicinally for a lot of purposes. Again, it is an, an astringent. It was used for various bladder uh, related ailments and so on. Uh, these are the two common species, the wing sumac and the smooth sumac. Pass those around. Um, sarsaparilla is a known one. It came up multiple times. Uh, we had informants who said that sarsaparilla tea had helped save infants who had um, uncontrolled diarrhea, which was the, the most common way of dying in the 19th century. And this was especially common in the Gulf Coastal Plain, informants saying that um, sarsaparilla was in a really important medicinal plant that they collected. I should point out that it's difficult to know exactly what species uh, people are referring to in a lot of these instances. So uh, sarsaparilla or sarsaparilla a common name is used for a number of different species, but uh, the one I really think was most medicinally used is something called uh, dwarf greenbrier green or smilax cumula, and it, it's found across the southern counties and sandy soils of the coastal plain, and it's not a spiny greenbrier. It's kind of a little low-growing one with no thorns, has red fruit, orange to red fruit, and I think this is one that, that was uh, perhaps what was being referred to. This is the, another variety of, of uh, oh, this is sassafras, sorry. Um, sassafras was considered a blood tonic or a blood purifier, and it was drunk in the spring. It was also one that we had influence from across the state saying that they collected sassafras and drank it as a tea each spring. And this is a, a very common tree in Arkansas. It's found throughout the state. Uh, the root, well, the leaves are very fragrant, sort of a lemony scent to them. Uh, you can make a tea out of the fruit, the leaves, or, or oftentimes the root. So people would extract the root, dig it up, uh, maybe even chip it up and uh, brew it in water so it's boil it. Uh, sumac, very common species. Snake root. I would love to know which plant snake root is. Apparently there are a lot of different things called snake root, but snake root was a really important um, one that came up in our research, and you know, I'm going to let you talk about it. So snake root, uh, very widely referred to, fever breaker, uh, used for a broad, uh, or claimed to be used for a broad uh, array of, of uh, treatments, and it's difficult to know what plant is being talked about. You see the name black snake root a lot of times, and that can be several different species. I think the three most likely ones are two small herb size uh, plants in the genus Aristolochia, also called Dutchman's Pipe. Um, there's Virginia black snake root and Texas black snake root, which uh, both are very medicinal. So, you know, some of these things you wonder are these really, uh, is there efficacy of these treatments or these compounds? But these, there's no doubt. I mean, if you dig this up and you smell the root, you almost fall over. I mean, it's the most intense medicinal smell. It's absolutely an amazing scent. Uh, very, very strong. And they're worth a lot of money today by wild root diggers. So people that, that trade in uh, wild, wild harvested uh, native plants, uh, they dig it up. And I mean, it takes a lot of them to get a pound of root, but it's very expensive. I, I forget what the actual uh, dollar amounts are, but they flower uh, at the ground level. So the flowers are not up high on the plant. They're down in the leaf litter under the leaves. And like the pawpaw, they don't smell good, and they're pollinated by little beetles and things that crawl around in the, in the leaf litter. These are the fruit and flowers sort of down here low on those two. You can check those out. And then uh, another one that's very, very, very common in Arkansas is what today is called Canadian or Canada black snake root, uh, Sinicula canadensis. Very widespread to the carrot family. And it's supposedly been used for lots of different medicinal purposes. So I'm pretty sure maybe one of these three 
would account for most of the mentions that we find of black snake root. Um, black willow is pretty well known as a, sort of a natural form of aspirin, so you can chew it for a headache, it's a fever breaker. Yeah, and, and black willow again is very common in the state. It's throughout the state, it's in wet areas. We find it today in some roadside ditches and so on. It was always in creek banks and swamp margins and that kind of place, marshes. Um, we've got a couple specimens of it in flower and fruit. And it was the bark oftentimes that was used. The inner bark has this salicylic acid, which is akin to acetosalicylic acid, which is an ingredient in aspirin. And it was widely used and still used today. This is, um, I think, ready for a comeback. Pokeberries were great for arthritis, and there is a healthy online community of people who will tell you how to brew your own pokeberry wine today, and that it can treat your arthritis today. And many of these people, I'm sorry to go off on a tangent, but they have um, had ill effects from opiates, and some of them have suffered addiction, and so they're afraid to take stronger medication. And they are firm believers that we all need to go get some vodka, stick some poke berries in it, and let it set for a couple of weeks and come back. So I'm going to try this someday because people are very excited about it. But I mean, these things, you have to have knowledge. One young man, when he was young when this happened, he said, you know, we were impressed into the Civil War to fight for the Confederacy. We were forced to fight for the Confederacy, and they didn't beat us enough. And we remembered that our mothers would gather poke weed. And so they gathered the wheat and ate it, and he was the only one who survived. Because later in the season, poke wheat is poisonous. You have to gather it at a certain time, and you have to boil it again and again. So these things take real expertise and knowledge, and that is a body of expertise that was passed down from families. Unfortunately for him, that process was interrupted by slavery in the Civil War. But it's important to keep these things in mind, that what is medicine is also poison. Is this the same as poke salad? Yeah. It is, yeah. So, poke salad is the name for the greens of this plant, the leaves, and uh, it has high concentrations of oxalic acid, and they're little crystalline spheres, basically. They be broken down and dissolved and pulled out. So, if you cook poke salad, uh, you need to boil the leaves, the young leaves, uh, and pour the water off a few times to get that out. And then they're totally edible and, and highly nutritious, in fact. Uh, and the, the berries are also uh, used for other things that they're not edible to humans, I don't think. I wouldn't recommend eating the leaves. So handle this with caution, uh, prepare it appropriately. A very common uh, plant of disturbed habitats. Widespread. Um, so the last plant I'm going to mention is bone set. Uh, bone set is an antiviral. And at, at just looking at bone set, I, I, at the time I was taking the medicine they give you when you have the flu to shorten it. And that is a synthesized chemical that mimics the chemical in bone set. So this was given by um, root doctors and elders in African American households to um, young people and family members who had fever. And it was also used, yeah, uh, the name bone set. I thought must come from it being used to people who have broken bones, and that's actually not the case. It was used as a fever breaker, and they would describe fevers, these really intense fevers from viral infection, as a bone break fever. And uh, that's, I guess, mainly what it was, what I've come across it was for was treating fevers or viral infections and fevers. There's uh, a specimen over here. Again, widespread species of wet habitat. So, as I said, so many cool animals, I wish we could just keep you here for hours and hours, but you need to go back to work. So, um, let me just mention a, um, a few things at the leaving before we leave. One thing I want to mention is that we can't talk about how important natural places were in African American life in Arkansas <coughs> without mentioning that the first um, game law that I know of, conservation law, was introduced by an African-American representative from Lee County named William Furbush, and it was proposed in 1879, and it failed. But to me, this is so symptomatic of our picture in environmental history that we, I had no idea, I don't think it's ever been written or recorded that the first game law was proposed by a black man. 
And I think we also need to ask, how is it, and you know, there's a whole body of evidence I don't have time to show you of African Americans talking about natural resources being why they moved here. The major migration to Arkansas almost all happened in response to laws passed in these various states that restricted African Americans from natural resources. Um, North Carolina had passed a law that African Americans could no longer pick berries. Or that, I mean, it didn't say black, it just said berry picking wasn't permitted. Um, Georgia had passed a law that prevented hunting and fishing in black majority counties, which they just listed by name, not black majority. And um, in uh, South Carolina, they ended the open range. That's what prompted that movement. And so when we think about what at the time was widespread knowledge of African-American intimacy with the land and wild resources. How did we get to where we are today? How do we lose that story? And why do you have people like Dr. Carolyn Finney saying, yeah, there is this, a narrative out there, a story that black Americans are alienated from nature and deeply unattached. She says, I push back on that because I think we're actually very attached. There are people of color who've invested blood, sweat, and tears into the land whose stories aren't acknowledged at all, let alone being recognized as people who care about the environment. Just because people haven't told the stories of how we show up in nature doesn't mean we don't have stories. So I think, you know, as a community, it, we have to discuss why is this the story that's out there and how should a more accurate story be informing our collective decision about parks, about nature, and about wild places. So we would be happy to take questions or let you flee since we'll catch you too, it's too long. But thank you so much for your time. about the berries and, and the things. Are these still used by herbalists now? Yes. For whole body health? <clears throat> the question was about the medicinal plants, in particular the berries. Are they still used today by herbalists and others that, that you know, use native plants or natural plants for, for medicinal purposes? And the answer is yes. I have a question. Where do the bees come from? Uh, those are your. Where did the bees come from? Was the question. They're European honeybees, so they came from uh, Eurasia and even I think northern Africa, maybe. Mm -hmm. uh, but they came over early, early on with explorers, settlers. Yeah. Yes, uh, have they come popping any of these old remedies and doing clinical trials on them in hospitals? I've heard a little bit about. The question was, are they compounding any of these? plants and, and using them in clinical trials and hospitals and so on. Uh, there is research going on into some of these uh, natural plant compounds. Of course, a lot of the medicines we have now that are syn synthetic now originally were plant-derived. Uh, it's just cheaper for them to make them in a lab. But yeah, they, there are some, a lot of things are still going on in trials. Yeah. Yes? Several plants you talked about were common in disturbed ground. How did they get here? Uh, is the, are they native to here? Are they something that came across as settlement came across? That's a good question. So the question was, are the plants of disturbed ground native or were they introduced? And it's both. I mean, there's there are native weedy plants. Just because they're native here doesn't mean they're not adapted to disturb it. So you have a lot of things that are uh, found in the wild where you know, there's some kind of a, a, a tornado damage or a river floodplain or a gravel bar or something that's disturbed naturally. And those are a lot of those plants that expanded their range or their uh, number of habitats they were found in when we started to do agriculture and forestry and so on. Uh, and then others, of course, like you suggested, have come from overseas uh, with um, either accidentally or on purpose. So some of those are very weedy as well. So it's a mix. Uh, you mentioned the, how you see uh, in these narratives here, 
popping up the relationship with African Americans to the land, um, and how you know now there's obviously this disconnect. Is there a certain time when you start to see a drop off in those mentions in the narratives? Um, so the question is, when do I start to see a drop off in what I'm going to call public narratives or drop in white dominated narratives about uh, African Americans in the land? And I would say it very specifically coincides with. Um, white violence against African Americans in rural places. It's really remarkable if you look at Guy Lancaster's work and you map it out. There are 23 communities where African Americans who are property holding, have great jobs, are driven from these towns between about 1892-ish to about very early 1920s. And I, I have this remarkable article that I look at a lot from the Arkansas Democrat in 1911, in the middle of this violence. And you know, at the beginning, because of homesteading, there was actually a pretty healthy African American population in the Ozarks, up to 11 to 13 percent in a lot of counties that had some space on the River Valley, some in the Ozarks. And you see this article after, you know, the newspaper's been full of black people being driven out of the Ozarks at gunpoint, and it says, um, it says, uh, it, it's, the people of color and the people of color, but it says, uh, I will say, African Americans are rare birds in the Ozarks. And I thought, what an interesting way to naturalize violence, to make it, oh, black people just don't like the mountains. That's not, we drove them out at gunpoint last year and said that we would kill anybody who stayed. So I think when it started, that was actually a very deliberate way to construct that narrative. I don't think that that is true anymore. I think people don't even realize that, um, I think most people have no idea that black folks lived in the mountains long after the Civil War and were typically driven out, so. Who has table ready? Uh, hopefully. Oh, I know. My mom's working on some right now. <laughs> <laughs> I have some. my yard. Yeah. Hopefully, once you see a few pictures of it, you'll see it everywhere. You can go to any of the parks in the city of Little Rock, and you'll see that beautiful purple berry. And a red stem. It's got a big reddish purple stem on the plant. It's pretty obvious. When you see it. Yes, ma'am. Now that you've introduced us to this knowledge, um, is there a way that, you know, you talk about some of the leaves and, and bushes and that people uh, can taste and experience. So is there a program that, you know, nature lovers or curious people like us won't poison ourselves? <laughs> that is such a cool idea. You know, I, I don't know of any programs other than uh, their at state parks, um, there's a woman who works at the Ozark Folk Center named Tina Marie Wilcox, and she does some sorts of programs like that, I think. Uh, I've not gone to them, but I, I think it's, I think that and then there was a woman, what's that? They're wonderful. They're wonderful, yeah. There, there is another state park interpreter at another park, and I can't think okay. of it. And she's actually done a couple of programs at St. Joe's. Okay, Joseph's. yeah, yeah, yeah. And I think uh, there's a woman uh, named Tamara Walking Stick who used to work for the extension service. I think she may be retired, but I think she also would do some programs like that. And um, that's a great idea to put that on. Um, the Master Naturalists is a nonprofit group that uh, goes to training. It's kind of like Master Gardeners, but they're not necessarily gardening, but they're learning about nature. And uh, that group gets a lot of intensive training every every Saturday. They have workshops and so on. They get the certification. And that might be a, a group that would be interested in hosting something like that. So, good idea. So many of the plants you mentioned as edible and medicinal plants are also natural dyes. Are you seeing that showing up in the narratives? Uh, I'm not, so I don't have a lot of examples, but the one I have is so good. Um, there was an African-American sociologist who went and lived in Menifee, Arkansas in 1935 for a year. And he collects all these stories. And he's talking to one man, and they talk about we made all our own clothes because we didn't want to go into the debt, into debt with a white man for anything. So we made more, they called them mammy made clothes. We had to wear a mammy made suit a long time. 
and two boys are playing on, the, the grandfathers are relating the story to him in the 1930s. They said, we were playing at school. So he started to make fun of my home-dyed, mammy-made suit, and he was talking about my mom, and I had to take him down. <laughs> <laughs> but in their vulnerable the descriptions, also, um, he interviews a lot of the women, and they talk about what it was like to die, to spin the thread, and some of that we excerpted and got into the Arkansas Historical Quarterly. But if there's anybody who would like me to send you the Dropbox link, I'd be happy to do it. There are a lot of dye plants. Uh, <coughs> false indigo, uh, the husks of the black walnut tree that surround the fruit make a beautiful brownish color dye. And that's why they used to dye fabric as well. Yes, ma'am. I, I was reading something about uh, during the Civil War that they didn't have, uh, and you might have covered it, about, um, like, is it lambs here? There's a weed that grows on the side of the, the road, and they would take it, and, uh, and it had medicinal purposes. They would put it on a wound, and they used it as a healer. Like you know what I'm talking about? Yeah, we, we did see lambs here. So that's another one that's sort of tough to know what they're talking about, specific what species. There's a uh, cultivated lambs here that came from overseas that's widely planted in gardens and used medicinally. But there's another one that's a weedy native, or not native, but a, a weedy introduced plant called woolly mullen that has the same texture. Very widely used, it's great big leaves, big yeah. circular growth of leaves. And that uh, may very well be the, the species that's uh, oh. called lamb's ear and, and what you're talking about. It's something to the screen, sorry. Yeah, I think they did call it mullet. Yeah, that, that's almost certainly what that was. Well, how do you get access to uh, your project? Mm -hmm. You need to write it up and we're looking for an open source place to put it, but I'm, we're happy to share primary sources with you or a copy of our talk. Um, but we really see this as just the beginning. I mean, I, I feel like we could have gone on for seven hours and we barely scratched the surface. And one of the things we'd really love to see is um, African American family historians. These are questions that um, I always ask in my Arkansas history classes, whose grandmother practices medicine with things from nature? And it's very interesting because I get two populations. I get African-American students and white students from the middle of Ozarks, not the region around Bentonville, but like more like Stone County and so forth. And so this knowledge is still out there and we'd love to share and you know help somebody else get their project started. Uh, kind of building on that, I was wondering, you know, now that you've unearthed these narratives and sort of drawn these connections between the native flora and um, these narratives, what's sort of what's sort of the next step in y'all's research? I know you're kind of in the this middle of the This seems crazy, but we, we're actually done. I'm not an environmental historian. I kind of tapped the end of my knowledge. I think I've dragged Theo out of you so many times, he's got a limit too. So we're really looking to give it away because there's more to be done. And, and you know, we'll write an article to deliver what we gave to you guys and some more about the animals. But um, yeah, it's it's way bigger than we can handle. We'd love to see other people take it up. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. So much.